Hey guys, my name is Tom Periello. I'm one of the founders of Race Publica that runs DarfurGenocide.org, uh, a site we started in 2004 to support whatever efforts we could to stop the genocide in, uh, in Darfur. And my partner, Ricky Patel, and I uh, have both worked as security analysts before as well. And we went in 2005 to spend quite a bit of time uh, inside Darfur with rebels and with civilians uh, trying to come up with a strategic end game for how to bring justice to people in Darfur. And what I'm going to talk about today is a bit of the political context for this genocide and what that means for how we can bring justice to people in Darfur. And i got to tell you, one of the biggest surprises for me when I went um, was that at the time, a lot of us were talking about the importance of a ceasefire and the importance of peacekeepers. And we went in and met with people in Darfur, and this was in the rebel-held territory, not the government-held territory. Um, the main answer I heard, particularly from the women's councils that were still surviving in many of these villages, was, we would rather go back to war than accept a ceasefire that keeps us oppressed. And what this, uh, this pointed out for us was that this genocide was more about political oppression than it was about racial hatred. And unless we understand that, we end up offering a set of solutions, often humanitarian solutions, rather than justice-based solutions, uh, that may be doing more harm than, we, than good for the people in Darfur. What does that mean? Why were these people who had suffered for years and seen their villages slaughtered saying they would rather go back to war than accept a peace deal that continued to oppress them? Well, uh, we often say, give me liberty or give me death, and that's part of it. But these people had experienced over 50 years of systematic oppression from the regime in Khartoum, various forms, but all the same end result, which was political marginalization of people throughout all the regions of the country, other than the tribe from the north. Certainly there's a racial component to that, because those are the more Arab rather than black African members of the state. But you basically had a situation where a group that didn't represent the people was maintaining uh, dictatorial control over the rest of the country. In Darfur, we have so often focused on, killing, on, on ending the killing that we don't realize that that's actually perfectly fine with the regime in Khartoum. Their main goal is to ensure that there is no democratic representation of the people. So as long as it's a ceasefire that locks in and legitimizes their control over the region, they're perfectly happy with that. One of the dirty little secrets of this genocide is it was actually a counterinsurgency genocide. People in Darfur saw the people fighting in the south for their democratic rights and eventually said, well, shouldn't we do that as well? Don't we have just as much of a right as people in the south of the country to finally get our representation in the government? When they began to demand that, the government came in with a blitzkrieg, slaughtering people. They brought in the Janjaweed to be their foot soldiers, but it was always the central government. One of the other shocks for us in going over there after so much of the media coverage was that most of the Darfurians we spoke with were not that upset with the Janjaweed. For them, it was all about the central government. It was the central government that was masterminding the systematic oppression. And until we came up with a solution that actually reduced the central government's control over the people in Darfur, we weren't going to actually solve the problem. We might staunch the killing briefly until we stopped paying attention and moved on to the next crisis, and then the government would come in and begin the same thing again. So then the question becomes, if all they want is democratic representation, why don't they have it? And this is where the genocide really comes down to a simple numbers game. The regime itself in Khartoum represents somewhere between 3% and 10% of the population, yet they control the vast majority of central power. When there had been a 20-year civil war with the South against the Christians and animists of the South, and eventually with support from the US and others, the Southerners were able to get a fair deal called the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. Or CPA. Under that deal, they got 28% of the central parliament. That represented their percentage of the population, which is normal in a democracy. The regime held on to 52%, so they still had uh, majority control of the parliament. 
which left 20% for everyone else in the country, in the East and in the West, where Darfur was. Here's where we come up with the problem. If you give Darfur the same peace deal that the South got, which is the only one that anyone thinks is remotely fair, i.e. one that gives them proportional representation, that's about 20% of the population. So the question becomes, where does that 20% come from? Do you take it away from the South, which fought for 20 years to get its democratic representation? That doesn't make any sense. Do you take it from everyone else in the country, further disenfranchising people who are already oppressed? Or do you take it away from the central government, that 5% that's already way out of whack? Well, you see the problem here, right? If you take the 20% out of here, even if you take only 3% out of then the cartoon regime no longer controls the parliament, which is unacceptable to the dictatorial regime in cartoon. So here is the, pro the reason that drives this genocide. It's a desire by this regime in cartoon to maintain control over the country, despite the fact that it has no claim on democratic representation. This creates the problem. Eventually, the Bush administration and others, with the urging of many groups, realized that we needed to shift the focus from peacekeepers to peace talks. This led to the Darfur Peace Agreement, or DPA. The problem with the DPA is that it ended up being along the terms that Khartoum wanted. It didn't offer people even remotely close to democratic representation. What happened? They were trying to get, put it this way, if you come up with a draft peace deal and the Khartoum regime is ready to sign it, and the rebels who represent the people of Darfur won't sign it, there's a pretty good chance you're standing on the wrong side of the genocide. And that's in fact what happened with the DPA, was that we ended up with a deal that locked in and legitimized under international law the regime's control, undemocratic control over the country. The rebel groups say, kept saying to the US negotiators, we can't sign this. And the negotiators kept asking, acting like this was some unconscionable act to, on the part of the rebels. And the rebels kept saying to them, you don't get it. We literally cannot bring this deal back to our people or they will run us out of town. Our people aren't stupid. They understand what the DPA means. The DPA means that the genocidaires win. Can you imagine seeing your people slaughtered by an oppressive regime? and then being told that you have to sign a peace deal that gives them majority control over you and your people at the state level, gives you almost no representation at the federal level. You couldn't go back to your people and say to them, well, we just fought, we all died, and now we're going to accept this deal that basically puts us back almost where we were at the beginning. Nonetheless, they eventually got one guy, they sort of bought him off with offers to visit the White House to sign the deal. And sure enough, when he went back, to try to pitch this deal to people in Darfur, they ran him out of town, literally. He could not even get a meeting once people understood the terms of the deal, for good reason. So, you have a solution that everyone understands, uh, which is democratic representation for Darfur within a federalist state. Um, you have a roadblock, which is that the regime will never accept that deal because it puts them into minority control. So if we know that the only solution is justice, and if we know that the only way to get there is by reducing the influence of the regime, that takes us to three potential solutions, all of which can be labeled regime transition. There is no solution in Darfur or in the other conflicts in Sudan that are either just closing up or just starting, other than slowly moving this regime out of power. There are three ways that we can do that and focus our energies. First and foremost, absolutely most important, is starting over with the, the Darfur Peace Agreement. We need to scratch the deal. It was an unconscionable deal. Darfurians wouldn't go for it, uh, for good reason, and start from scratch. It was the right impulse to focus on peace talks. It was the wrong impulse to do it on cartoons terms. So first and foremost, we want to have a new peace deal that gives basic proportional representation uh, to people in Darfur. Slowly that will spread to people in uh, New Valley and other parts of the east of the country, and you can democratize one region at a time. The second, which is getting a lot of attention in diplomatic circles, is waiting for the national elections that are scheduled to happen, I believe, in two years. 
The problem with this strategy uh, on its own is that it assumes that we're going to be able to conduct fair elections in this area and that dynamics in the South are going to remain stable enough. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why this is a good approach, but I think it's a bit naive overall as a strategy. So we should be headed in this direction, but we shouldn't think that without dealing with these other problems, it's going to be a solution. The third is what I would call either the Charles Taylor model or the Milosevic model of regime change using international law. Uh, based on the advocacy of many of you watching this video, the International Criminal Court was given the case of Darfur as a genocide, and it is currently pursuing that and has issued indictments. Indictments have been an effective strategy for regime transition that has the kind of validity and success that has not been present in military-based approaches to regime transition. In the Milosevic case, his indictment by the International uh, Court for um, former Yugoslavia um, was that it delegitimized him so much that Serbians voted him out of office because they understood that the regime would not have any legitimacy in the international community as long as an indicted war criminal was at the head. It played a huge role in that election. In the Charles Taylor model, the special court for Sierra Leone, where, in full disclosure, I was working as a special advisor to the prosecutor, indicted Charles Taylor while pressure was mounting from rebel groups within in the international community. The UN then showed up, and he was saying, I will never leave power, and they said, look, you can stay there and we'll arrest you tomorrow, or you can get on a plane to Nigeria, which he did and went into exile as an indicted war criminal, and then eventually was handed over and now sits in The Hague. These are ways that we're increasingly see that international justice can play a role in creating this kind of transition. The reality we have to face, though, is that if we don't succeed in one of these three, the fourth option is a violent overthrow. If we do not succeed in coming up with a smart form of regime transition with the legitimacy of international law and support, there's a very good chance that the rebel groups um, who uh, have generally a very good track record of civilian support and um, uh, compliance with, with the Geneva Conventions will join forces and overthrow the government in a violent and bloody process. So these three are the good things to be advocating. Where does that take us? There are three action steps on which we think activists in the U.S. should be focused if they want to have them. First and foremost, demanding a new Darfur peace agreement. This should be the centerpiece of all of our advocacy. It is what Darfurians want. They want justice. They want basic democratic representation. Uh, they want resource sharing um, and development and the other basic things uh, that are essential to human dignity. It's a, it's a no-brainer ask, and it's the centerpiece of what we should go for. Any effort to get African peacekeepers or UN peacekeepers on the ground cannot and should not be an excuse to protect the status quo. They must be there to enforce and ensure a peace deal that actually gives Darfurians what they deserve and make sure that the genocide is not in fact successful and that we are a proxy force protecting the status quo that the regime wants. The second, which is really central to any of the things that we talked about, is taking the rebel groups, which have a very good track record militarily, but are disastrous on the political front, and help them develop the political leadership. We spent quite a bit of time with both rebels and civilians, and I must say this is the most impressive set of rebel groups I've ever been around in any country. Uh, I'm not wide-eyed and naive about rebel groups. I've seen some horrible, horrible things. What you have here is a group of generals at the local level that have extremely high levels of support and legitimacy with their people. But at the political leadership level, the rebels are now totally fractured, riven by ego conflicts and other things. Until we can take that military force and turn it into a legitimate political party and leadership to represent people in Darfur, who is it that's going to negotiate at the peace talks? Right now, the rebels represent those people, but they don't have that level of political leadership and legitimacy that they need. We as an international community need to be supporting efforts to build up the political representation leadership and third of all, we should be supporting the ICC, pressuring it to get its act together more quickly, uh, to demand indictments of the top officials in the regime. Uh, one of the problems with this, with this genocide so far is that it's been a nameless, faceless genocide. 
There isn't a Milosevic, a Hitler, a Charles Taylor that was in genocide of crimes against humanity case of a clear bad guy. There are bad guys. The presidents, the vice presidents, the Bashirs, the Tahas. Uh, these are the men who have been consciously and strategically orchestrating this genocide. We need to know their names, we need to be supporting their indictment, and then supporting their arrest, or at least their active transition from power. Uh, we think that that's what the people of Darfur want. We think it's what they deserve. Uh, and we think it's what's necessary to create the precedent that genocide will not be rewarded, it will be punished. And without that, we create a move in the wrong direction. So this comes down for us to the idea of handcuffs, not handshakes. Handshakes are fine in a peace agreement. What we've been more focused on is photo ops, where we say, let's shake hands with the regime, let's get another ceasefire, which they then just use and use and use to perpetuate uh, the slow starvation of people in Darfur. The time has come for handcuffs and for blunt talk about regime transition. Short of that, I think we won't be doing much good for the people in Darfur. Thank you for watching this video. Uh, you can contact us through darfurgenocide.org or me through uh, tom at avaz, A-V-A-A-Z.org. And we would love to hear from you, and uh, we hope that you find this useful. Thank you.